Have you ever thought about swimming with dead people? Hi, my name's Eric Kiska, and you probably don't know me. I'm the associate producer and managing editor of the Detroit History Podcast. I also do a podcast with my own friends called A24 on the Rocks. I also do freelance podcast editing and consulting. I'm also a mail carrier, so I can actually pay my bills. What have they done to us? What did they do to us? I was raised in a suburb outside of Detroit called Gross Point Woods, and I grew up loving the Great Lakes and going to cabins up north with my friends, and I eventually went to Northern Michigan University on the shores of Lake Superior in Marquette, Michigan. I spent a lot of time going cliff jumping, hiking, having bonfires on the beach, gazing at the stars, swimming, and even seeing Northern Lights a few times. Although I had a lot of fun around the Great Lakes, I quickly learned that once a year, somebody would drown in Lake Superior due to something called riptide currents. This led me to wonder just how much death has there been in the Great Lakes. As you've seen this photo here, there's shipwrecks nearly everywhere you go around Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. The Great Lakes have accounted for over 6,000 shipwrecks and have claimed tens of thousands of lives if you take all the drownings into account. I grew up hearing about shipwrecks like the Titanic and the Atlantic Ocean, along with all the hurricanes that come from there, but not a lot of people grow up thinking about all the shipwrecks that take place in the Great Lakes. After doing a bit more research, I was pretty taken aback by all the death that's been around the Great Lakes. It made me think that the Great Lakes are almost kind of like the catacombs in Paris. But instead of people going about their daily lives, walking above all these grave sites in Paris, around the Great Lakes, we swim, we fish, we cliff jump above all these grave sites and all these shipwrecks. It's quite eerie if you think about it. So in my time in the Upper Peninsula, I grew this kind of fearful respect for the Great Lakes. They grew to be quite mystical in my eyes, almost like they were something more than just bodies of water. I graduated with a degree in English writing in 2014, a degree they've since discontinued, thanks to my alma mater for that. And then I moved back down to the Metro Detroit area, but I was always drawn back to these great and powerful lakes. Combine that with my love for history, I really had to learn more about it. Not just the history, but some of the folk tales surrounding them. I felt like since I had such a reverence for these lakes, a lot of people must have the same kind of reverence. So I started learning from the beginning. If you aren't from around the Great Lakes, then you might wonder how they were formed. Basically, a little over 100,000 years ago during the last ice age or last glacial period, most of Canada and the United States was covered by glaciers. This was called the Laurentide Ice Sheet. Glaciers will move over long periods of time and they will dredge and erode the surface of the earth. The dredging and erosion created basins, or basically large empty bathtubs in the earth. Towards the end of this ice age and after, these glaciers started to fill up these bathtubs with fresh water, and the areas around Michigan had some of the largest basins in the world. The last glacial period ended in about 11,700 BC. And most archaeologists think that indigenous people stepped foot south of the Laurentide Ice Sheet in the United States in about 20,000 to 15,000 BC. Once the Laurentide Ice Sheet melted, these indigenous people started to make their way towards what is now known as the Midwest. And it's believed that the first signs of indigenous people in the Great Lakes region was in about 11,000 BC. But now let's fast forward to 2007 AD, where an underwater archaeologist from Northwestern Michigan University named Dr. Mark Holly started doing dives in the Grand Traverse Bay area of Lake Michigan. When he was doing this dive, he was finding old boats and cars and even Civil War artifacts. But it wasn't long before he found one of the best archaeological discoveries of the last 100 years. He found underwater rock structures in Lake Michigan. And there looked to be human activity or a petroglyph on one of these rocks. Some think that they may have carved a mammoth or a mastodon on it. Sensationalists online have coined this the Great Lake Stonehenge, and have even drummed up conspiracies that aliens placed it here, kind of like the monoliths in 2001 A Space Odyssey. But Dr. Holly was very specific in saying that this is not a Stonehenge. Quote, The site seems to gain a life in the media about every six months or so. Sadly, much of the information out there is incorrect. For example, there's not a henge associated with the site, and the individual stones are relatively small when compared to what most people think of as European standing stones." Unquote. But that doesn't make it any less cool. Most experts claim that the stone engine in England dates back 5,000 years ago, or from 3,000 to 2,000 BC. But historians believe that the Great Lakes rock structures date back 9,000 years ago, or all the way to 7,000 BC. So basically, the next time you go to England, tell them that the most famous archaeological site of their time is not that special. Tell them that their food is bland and dry. And tell them that the Irish do pretty much everything they do, but better. Experts say that these rock structures were most likely created when Grand Traverse Bay was empty. But here's something even more crazy. These rock structures are not alone in early human activity at the bottom of the Great Lakes. Let's meet another Michigan professor, a guy by the name of Dr. John O'Shea from University of Michigan. 
he discovered something called the Drop 45 Line in Lake Huron on the other side of the mitten. Archaeologists believe that there was a dry land corridor between northeast Michigan and southern Ontario called the Amberley Alpena Ridge. It was essentially a land bridge about 56 kilometers southeast of Alpena, Michigan. They found evidence of limestone structures, cobble pavement, and V-shaped hunting blinds that were most likely used for hunting caribou. They've also found sharp edges in the sand near here that seem to be hunting instruments. They found campfire rings with charcoal, and they found stakes to stake down teepees. The whole area covers about 300 feet of underwater ground, or about 88.23 Hezbollahs. And these structures are 8 meters wide by 30 meters long. Or for us stupid Americans that can't use the metric system, that's about 26 feet wide by 98 feet long. Or, that would be like if you cloned Hezbollah 36.4 times and placed them in a flying V formation. Dr. John O'Shea believes that the rock structures found on the Lake Michigan side by Dr. Holly might be similar to the rock structures found on the Lake Huron side. They are most likely rocks that indigenous people use to hide behind before they jump out and ambush animals passing by. But you gotta wonder, what were these ancient civilizations like? Did they talk with funny accents like your governor? Oh, fix the damn roads! Oh, let me sneak by there! Did they put their caribou in some kind of early idea of a hot dog bun? Did they make caribou chili? Did they have some kind of mustard-like seasoning? Or did they put a vegetable on top? And did they eat caribou coney dogs? But more importantly, did they stick around and are they related to the Native American tribes that are still in the area? It's quite possible. But all I'm certain of is there's a lot more going on in the depths of these lakes and the surrounding areas. So that's why I started this YouTube series, Tales of the Great Lakes, so people can share in the reverence that I have for these bodies of water. Maybe you'll learn something. Maybe you'll be creeped out by all the spooky stories that are from around here. Maybe you'll just pass some time at work while you want to procrastinate. Who knows, but I hope you enjoy this series. Next time, we'll be looking at the most famous American shipwreck outside of the Titanic, and that's the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. As Gordon Lightfoot once said, The lake it is sad never gives up her dead when the skies of November turn gloomy. I'll leave you on that note.